But when you depart from me, sorrow abides, and happiness takes his leave. You embrace your charge too willingly. Ah, I think this is your daughter. Uh, her mother hath many times told me so. Did <laughs> <laughs> you ask her? Say you Benedict, no, for then were you a child. Ah, you have it full, Benedict. We may guess it's by what you are, ah. being a man. Oh, you all duty. I thank you. I am not of many words. Well, I thank you. <laughs> Please, you go, Grace. Lead on. Your hand, Leonardo, we will go together. But a dream until it appears itself. But I shall acquaint our daughter with all that she may be the better prepared for an answer. If dear better this be true. <laughs> what a good year, my good husband. And Benedict is not the most unhopefulest husband I know. Thus <laughs> far can I praise him. He is of no his quick wit and queasy stomach. He shall fall in love with Beatrice if we can do this. <laughs> Cupid is no longer an archer, for its glory shall be ours, and we are the only love gods! <laughs> Go in with me, and I will tell you my drift. <laughs> no! Nor I neither! <laughs> but most wonderful that she should so dote on Signor Benedict, whom she hath in all outward behavior seemed ever to abhor. <laughs> <laughs> Discovers it, my lord. Why? What effects of passion shows she? Hey, look, well, this fish will bite. <laughs> what effects? She will sit you. You heard my daughter tell you how. Uh, she did indeed. How? How, I pray you? I pray thee, tell Benedict of it, and hear what he will say. What, for a good thing, you? Oh, hero thing, surely she will die, for oh. oh. she says she will die if oh. I love not, and she will die if oh. I love not, and she will die oh. if he woo her, rather than she beg one breath of her accustomed crossness. She doth well, if she should make tender her love, tis very possible he'll scorn it, for the man, oh. as you know all, hath a contemptible spirit. Uh, he <laughs> is a very proper man. He hath indeed some good Outward happiness. My God, and in my mind, very wise. He does indeed show some sparks that are like wit. And I take him to be valued. And Hector, I assure you, in the managing of quarrels, you must necessarily keep peace. If he breaks peace, he ought to enter into a quarrel with both fear and trembling. And so will he do, for the man doth fear God. Howsoever, it seems not in him by some large jest. What is it, my good friends? Good woman, Vargas, sir, speaks a little off the matter. An old woman, sir, and her wits are not so blunt as God help I would desire they were. But in faith, honest as the skin between her brows. <laughs> yes, I thank God. I am as honest as any woman living that is an old woman and no monster than I. Comparisons of odorous, polyphorous neighbor Vargas. Neighbors, you are tedious. <laughs> it pleases your worship to say so. <laughs> the real blood dukes, officers. But truly, for mine own part, if I were as tedious as the king, I could find it in mine own heart to bestow it all of your worship. <laughs> <laughs> All thy tediousness on me, eh? And for a thousand pound more than tis, for I hear as good explanation of your name and all the men. What should I speak? I stand dishonored that have gone about to link my friend with a common stare. Are these things spoken, or do I but dream? Sir, they are spoken, and these things are true. This looks not like a nuptial. True. <laughs> not stand I. Uh, is this the prince's? Is this the prince's brother? Is this face here? Are our eyes our own? Oh, this is so, but what of this, my lord? Let me but move one question to your daughter. By that fatherly and kindly power that you have in her, bid her answer me truly. I charge thee do so. 
And as thou art my child. Oh, God, defend me! How am I beset with kind of I didn't call you this! Answer truly to your name! Is it not Hero? Who can blot that name with any just Mary, reproach? Mary, that can Hero! Hero itself can blot out Hero's language without offense to utter them. <laughs> Thus, oh, pretty lady, I am sorry for thy much misgovernment. Hero, a hero hadst thou been if half thy graces had been placed about thy thoughts and counsels of thy heart. But fare thee well, most foul, most fair. Farewell, thou pure impiety and impious purity for thee. I'll lock up all the gates of love, and on my eyelids shall conjecture hang to turn all beauty into thoughts of harm. Nevermore shall it be gracious. Half no man stagger here a point for me. Why? Where, where, cousin, wherefore sing you down? Oh, these things come thus light, smother her spirits up. Hold off the lady. That I think. Hero, why, hero? Uncle, sing your magic. Thy help, uncle. Oh, fate, take not away thy heavy hand. Death is the fairest cover for her shames that may be wished for. How now, cousin? Have comfort, lady. Dost thou look up? Yea, wherefore should she not? Wherefore? Why doth not every earthly thing cry shame upon her? Could she here deny the story that is printed in her blood? Do not live, she wrote. Do not ope thine eyes, for did I think thou wouldst quickly die? Thought I thy spirit was stronger than thy shames. Myself would, in disregard of consequence, strike at thy life. <laughs> Grieved I that I have but one child. Oh, one child too much by thee. Why had I one? Why ever was thou lovely in mine eyes? Why had I not with charitable hands took up a beggar's issues at my gate? <laughs> I, I might have said, no part of this is mine. It's shame to rise it from itself, from unknown loins. But mine, and mine I loved, and mine I was proud on, and mine I had praised, mine so much that I myself was to myself, not mine, valuing of her. Oh, why she has fallen into a pit of ink that the wide sea hath drops too few to wash her clean again, and salt too little to seize and give her foul tainted flesh. Sir, sir, be patient. For my part, I am so attired in wonder. I know not what to say. <laughs> oh, on my soul, my cousin he is belied. Lady, were you her bedfellow last night? No, truly not. But until last night, I have this twelve month bed for bedfellow. Confirmed. Confirmed. Oh, that is stronger made, which before was bobbed up with ribs of iron. Would the two princes lie? And Claudio lie? Who loved her so that speaking of her foulness washed it with tears? Hence from her? Let her die! Hear me a little! For I've only silent been so long, and given unto this course of fortune a noting of the lady. I have marked a thousand blushing apparitions to start to her face. Uh, this cannot be. She would not add to her damnation a sin of perjury. She not denies it! Lady. What man is he you are accused of? If they speak but truth of her, these hands 
shall tear her, but if they wrong her honor, the proudest of them shall well hear it. Time hath not yet so dried this blood of mine, nor age so eat up my invention, nor fortune made such havoc of my means, nor my bad life rent me of my friends. For they shall find, awaked in such a kind, both strength of limb and policy of mind, ability of means and choice of friends to quit me of them throwly. Pause a while, and let my counsel sway you in this matter. Your daughter here the prince is left for dead. Let her be secretly kept. What will this, what will this do? Marry this. While carried, shall on her behalf change slander to remorse. That is some good. But not for that dream I on this strange course, but on this travail for greater birth. She died as it must be so maintained upon the instant that she was accused, lamented, pitied, and excused of every hero. For it so falls out that what we have, every organ shall become appareled in more precious habit more moving, delicate, and full of life into the eye and prospect of his soul than when she lived indeed. Then shall he mourn if ever love had interest in his liver, and wish he had not accused her so. No, though he thought his accusation true. Let this be so, and doubt not but success will fashion the event in better shape than I can lay it down in likelihood, and if all in I advise you, and though you know my inwardness in love is very much unto the prince and Claudio, yet by mine honor I will deal in this as secretly and justly as your soul should with your body. Being that I flow in grief, the smallest twine may leave me. Tis well consented. Presently away, for the strange sores strangely they strain the cure. I pray thee, cease thy counsel, which falls into my ears as profitless as water in a sieve. Give not me counsel, nor let no comforter delight in my ear. Bring me a father who so loved his child, whose joys of hers overwhelmed <laughs> like mine, <laughs> and bid him speak of patience. <laughs> Measure his woe, the length and breadth of mine, and let it answer every strain for strain, as thus for thus, and such a grief for such, in every liniment, branch, shape, and form. <laughs> if such a one will smile, stroke his beard, bid sorrow wag and cry to him when he should groan, that grief with proverbs and make misfortune drunk with candle wasters. Bring him yet to me, and I of him will gather patience. <laughs> but there is no such man. <laughs> the man can counsel and speak patience through that grief which they themselves not feel, but tasting it. <laughs> that Comfort turns into passion, which before would give perceptual nets in the rage, better strong madness in a silken thread, chalk ache with air and agony with words. No, no. Tis all men's office to speak patience to those who ring under the load of sorrow. But no man's virtue nor su sufficiency to be so moral when they shall endure the like themselves. Therefore, give me no comfort. My griefs cry louder than all of thy words. They're undue men from children. I, <laughs> I pray thee, peace. I will be flesh and blood. But there was never yet a philosopher that could endure the toothache patiently, however, they have writ in the style of God and made a push to chance and severance. 